Good afternoon, everybody. Wonderful to see you. I'm Simon Woods. I'm president and CEO of the League of American Orchestras, in case you don't know me by now. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to everybody. It's wonderful to see such a full room. Uh, we thought we would lose some people on uh, Saturday morning, but it's wonderful that so many people have stuck around uh, for what I think is going to be a, an absolutely uh, riveting session today. And as we have um, some musicians from the Houston Symphony on stage, and we're going to come to a whole explanation about what they're going to play, I think it would be appropriate for us to say uh, right now, for us to express our gratitude for that absolutely phenomenal concert last night. It's what a great orchestra, and I'm, I'm really appreciative of, of uh, John Mangum and everybody at the Houston Symphony. You know, when we go to um, different cities for the conference, we always let the, the, the orchestra who's hosting make their own decision about what they want to present. And, you know, John from the very beginning wanted to make a big statement, and he certainly they did make a big statement last night. It was artistically compelling, it was an amazing cast, and at the center of it was a, a phenomenal orchestra. So, John. John, thank you very much for your vision. We really appreciate that. Okay, so today's closing session, we have more sponsors. We're always grateful to our sponsors. Today's closing session has been generously co-sponsored by Threshold Acoustics and YPTC, your part-time controller. Threshold Consultants uh, design places of gathering to learn, share wisdom, and pass along culture. Their approach to orchestral sound reinforces the subtlety, power, and delight that sound brings to the built environment. Threshold is represented here by partner Scott Pfeiffer. Thanks, Scott, and all the team. What? YPTC offers valuable services to all of their clients, including accounting, financial reporting, data visualization, and more. As a partner and strengthening agent, YPTC allows nonprofits to focus on what matters, furthering the mission of their organizations. YPTC is represented here today by director Andy Fanelli McGonigal, and manager Justine Townsend, and we thank you too for your support of the conference. And while we're on the subject of thanks, I want to say thank you to you all. We set ourselves a goal of 60,000 for League Giving Days, and we're already well through it, about 62,000. So we really, really appreciate it. And it's still going up. And we would, you know, we're, we're you know, as you know at the League, we be believe deeply in inclusion, and we would hate anybody to feel left out of the opportunity to support the League. So, so uh, if anybody is feeling like they, they, they're, they're left out of that, please stop by the, the desk at the end. Uh, and we really appreciate this amazing community of people who helps us um, put, on every, put on everything we do every year. So thank you to you all. So today, in this closing session, um, a bit of change of tone. We're going to explore for the next hour the remarkable power of music as a human right and the role it can play in working with refugee communities. I've been at a couple of major classical music conferences in Europe uh, over the past year, and it's interesting to note that this area of working with refugee communities is receiving increasingly vibrant recognition by orchestras and concert halls there, given the intense amount of immigration that, that many uh, European cities are experiencing. There's a lot to be learned from Europe, but there's a lot to be learned at home too. And there's important and meaningful work going on in this country. So this afternoon, we're going to learn some more about the way in which music can help new members of our communities to arrive, survive, and thrive. In 2019, the Houston Symphony, in partnership with Rice University, University of Houston and the Interfaith Ministries of Greater Houston celebrated the determination and hope of Houston's refugee communities through their collaborative project, Resilient Sounds. Under the supervision and mentorship of then Houston Symphony composer in residence, Jimmy Lopez Beido, six composers from Rice and the University of Houston were paired with members of Houston's refugee community in a way that enabled each composer to tell their refugee partner's story through the power of music. Creative partners 
such as vocalists, writers, dancers, or filmmakers, joined each pair to help bring these stories to life. The culmination of the project was a public performance of all six works featuring members of the Houston Symphony at White Oak Music Hall just prior to the pandemic. Today, we're absolutely thrilled to have Jimmy Lopez Baido with us. Uh, in conversation with Houston Symphony's Senior Director of Artistic Planning, Rebecca Zabinski, to discuss this groundbreaking project and tell you a little bit about um, what, it, what made it so meaningful. And then we're going to hear, after they speak, we're going to hear What It Takes to Thrive by Patrick W. Lentz, with words by Logan Butcher, narration and acting by Mohamed Yunus Kayerisman, conducted by the Houston Symphony's assistant conductor, Gonzalo Farias. So, much to look forward to. Please welcome Rebecca and Jimmy. Good afternoon, everyone. And Jimmy, thank you so much for making the trip to Houston once again to have this conversation with us. We're always so happy to have you with us. And I'm always happy to be back. <laughs> so Simon set this up really nicely, but I thought we could start by just to set up some context for the audience. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about the Resilient Sounds Project and how it was structured. Well, the Resilient Sounds Project went across a year and a half to two years, I think. And I always like to say that it was much, as much about the destination as the journey. Because what we had was, at the core, a mentorship program for six young composers. And as Simon said, three from Rice University and three from the University of Houston. And, but besides that, we actually gave it a human dimension when we paired each of those composers with a refugee from Houston, the Houston area. And for that, we had the help of Interfaith Ministries. To make things more complicated for us, <laughs> we decided to add creative partners. And the reason for this is I didn't want any work in the program to compete with the other. I wanted each of them to be completely unique. So we had one which was made for a film, another one that had a soprano as a soloist, like the one we're going to hear today had a narrator, and so forth. So each project was unique and special. And of course, that added to the complexity. But for that reason, we created this frame that was very well structured, started with, um, of course, an initial meeting with everyone, and then a workshop where we had just, we were testing the creative partners and a piano reduction for, uh, for, to see what the progress of the composers was. Uh, by then, they had already met the refugees and had shared their stories. Then we had another workshop with a full orchestra. They had private meetings with me for me to mentor the composers, and we had endless logistical discussions about how to bring this about. All of that culminating in the concert, of course, that really created this sense of community here. Yeah, and I think that the way you conceived it and the way that we created this project was really beautiful because every piece ended up being so unique, it, just like all of the stories that the composers were telling. But in terms of giving them experience in writing for the orchestral art form, they were also able to get experience working with other types of creative artists and understanding the additional layer of having to consider what a voice is capable of, what it meant to work with a dancer or a filmmaker. And on top of that, they were all in different levels of their own development and education because we had a bachelor's, a master's, and a doctoral student from each school. So it was diverse in many different ways. Um, and I think that that really made it so rewarding to see their growth over the course of the project. And we'll talk a little bit about down the road how those composers have had their own trajectory. So I remember sitting with you almost exactly six years ago at the hotel right across from Jones Hall having a discussion with some of our colleagues and that ended up being the conception of this project. But when you started as our composer in residence, you already had the idea in mind of doing a project working with young composers. So can you tell us a little bit about your inspiration and how the idea for this project came about? Absolutely. Well, my idea when I came to Houston was to really understand what was important to the city of Houston, you know, and, and really 
What, that's why we have these strategic meetings, these brainstorming meetings with the whole team. And one of the questions that I asked was, what is it that makes Houstonians most proud? And unlike what I thought, they will probably mention the space program, which we're all familiar with. They are very proud of it too, of course, but diversity came first. Uh, Houston being the most diverse urban area, um, ethnically speaking, in the United States. Not only that, it is also the city in the United States that welcomes the most refugees. So knowing this was actually an eye-opener, and it made me think, well, we need to actually broadcast this. We need to make this, we need to make a whole project about it, and I understand what they are proud about it. And that's when the idea of not only making, creating six new works, which in and on its own was of course very valuable for all the composers to work with musicians of the level of the Houston Symphony, uh, which every young composer doesn't get that chance, but to add this um, la layer of, of humanity to the project and to create connections within the fabric of Houston. Because these are people who were coexisting in the same society, probably visiting the same restaurants, but not necessarily talking to each other. And we had all these creative partners, composers, musicians, and refugees who had come from vastly different realities come together or create this project together. So that was actually what ignited the desire to make this um, what it is now. And I remember talking to the composers who are part of this program after they met their refugee partners and they were just blown away by the harrowing and inspiring stories, but also just the, the hopefulness and the light that they brought in all of their conversations. And I know they felt just so inspired and so moved and privileged to have made those connections. And just to shine a light on the work of Interfaith Ministries, Interfaith Ministries, uh, resettles legal refugees fleeing their homelands in fear of political, social, or religious persecution, and they provide services to the refugees such as housing, English classes, cultural orientation, job placement, and school enrollment. And over 90% of the refugees that Interfaith Ministries work with become independent and productive members of society after six months, which is extraordinary when you consider what it must take to become a part of a new community and learning a new language and learning how to live and starting from nothing in a community, it's really pretty amazing. So several of the composers that we worked with of the six, and all of them actually have gone on to embark on exciting professional journeys of their own. So I know you spent a lot of time working with them in workshops and um, a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentorship time with them, which I know is really valuable and really helped bring along a successful six performances for us. So are you still in touch with any of the composers that you worked with over the course of this project? Well, I just, I was in Houston recently for another premiere of mine, uh, the first part of my symphony, uh, Eclipse, and I met one of the composers who attended the concert, Victor, who was here uh, momentarily. He's gonna go uh, do a PhD now, and actually I have seen that two of our composers, Alejandro went back to Mexico, Erberg went back to Turkey, and they are doing really important work in their own respective countries, uh, interacting with a lot of high-level musicians and continue to create. And I've seen all our other composers also continue to flourish and continue their, advancing their degrees and their knowledge. So it makes me really proud to have actually been in touch uh, with them at some point and have been able to contribute a little bit to their development. Yeah, and we're sorry that Patrick, who is the composer of the piece that we'll be performing for you today, wasn't able to join us because he's now a composer and arranger in the United States Air Force Band. And so he wasn't able to get leave to join us, but I, hopefully he'll be able to see us on the live stream. So hi, Patrick. <laughs> we miss you. We're very proud of you. Yeah. So for those in the audience who might be interested in embarking on a project like this at their home orchestras who feel inspired by this work or by another thing that they've seen in the conference and are wanting to take on an ambitious project, what advice might you have for those people? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. I mean, uh, it really made my life so much richer. I think everyone here in Houston, there was not a single dry eye at the end of the concert because that audience was comprised of people who were deeply connected to the material. We always, 
we tend to think, or at least modern audiences used to, especially not less so now, to think that classical contemporary music was somewhat far removed from our reality. But we, with, through this project, have proved that there's nothing, nothing more far from it. Because in fact, by creating new works that were telling, retelling the stories of these refugees who belong to their community, I mean, here were their brothers, their sisters, their mothers, their children, uh, looking at a work that was celebrating their struggles and celebrating their triumph and the way that they over, overcame all these difficulties. And so seeing that on stage, uh, framed by a completely new work, was really moving, was really inspiring. So that's when we can harness the power of contemporary music to create works that are relevant to us today. You know, I, for example, when I was working here and I worked on this, my second symphony, I kept saying, well, Beethoven, with all his genius, couldn't have written a piece about the space program. You know, because it was just not his time. We are here in our time, let's celebrate our time, let's create works that celebrate our stories, the current stories, and that's how contemporary music can and have a very close and important impact in the everyday life of your audiences. So I think if you actually have that focus, if you come to a community like I did, I do not live in Houston, but I feel like I'm part of the family now through this project because I really immersed myself understanding what was important to this community. And I think us uh, artists who usually visit other places, we might be a little slightly disconnected with the places that we go. So it's important to really foster and try to encourage those connections. Well, Jimmy, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us today, and you're such an important part of the Houston Symphony family, and we're so glad that we were able to share some of this with all of the conference attendees. So if all of you will join me in welcoming the musicians of the Houston Symphony after the orchestra tunes, they will perform What It Takes to Thrive with music by Patrick W. Lentz, words by Logan Butcher, and narration by Muhammad Khairisman, conducted by our assistant conductor, Gonzalo Farias. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wish you would pick up your phone, Adil. We should talk about this. I know it's difficult being new here in America, but it isn't impossible. Inshallah, you are going to make it, Adil. It's a struggle, but we can't forget those first months in the camps of Nauru. The brutal days and sleepless nights, always worrying if we were going to be beaten that night. Living like prisoners, not speaking to family, and you're saying that you feel hopeless here? <laughs> I don't know, Adil. It's not like we can go back home. 
I don't want to end up a dead body in the streets. I just, I just want to study and work and live a good life. And I can't do that under constant threat of death because Parashinar wouldn't assist the Taliban. We have to leave. Naur, reminding me, one day, we won't be here. We'll make it to America, Farhan. We can make it there. You were my rock. Let me be yours now. You have to keep your hope, Adil. You have to keep your hope. part-time cashiering job at a 7-Eleven when I couldn't study engineering at home in Parashinar and I kept receiving death threats when my house was destroyed twice by Taliban rocket launchers I knew I had to leave! family behind, my parents, my brothers, my sisters, to live in fear for months. I almost died from enduring sickness and starvation and mosquitoes while walking through the jungles of Thailand I crossed the deadly cobra ocean in a tiny life raft where the waters were choppy and violent and dark and terrifying on an overcrowded boat on the Indian Ocean to finally be rescued by the Australian Coast Guard just to be taken to Nauru to be treated like a prisoner? No. No, that's not why I left Adil. And that's not why you left either. We left for our lives, Adil. For our freedoms. We left have a future. I did the math. There is enough people there for an actual Pakistani community. A community that will help each other. And at least I know you're there. We can actually have some connection to home, family traditions, not, not feel so alone. That 
That's it. I've been thinking about this for a while, but saying this out loud has confirmed and made me absolutely certain I'm coming to Houston. I'm coming to Houston. I've done all the research. America is the place where we can pursue our dreams. And Houston is the place where we can build our futures. I am coming to Houston. <laughs> oh, I will come and help you, Adil. Together, together we can find a better apartment. I can help you with your English. We can work to find school and training. I've done the research. It's all possible there. It is, Adil. Especially when we work together to get to America. Adil, we have done what it takes to survive. And now that we're here, we should do the work to thrive. Houston is the place where we can thrive, Adil. We can make a life for ourselves here in Houston. I hope you get this voicemail. You should save this and listen to it when you're feeling like how you're feeling today. Bye for now, okay? Keep your head up while you're there without me, Adil. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I love you very much. See you soon. Very soon. Tremendous, what a wonderful project. Thank you so much, um, Rebecca, Jimmy, Mohammed, Gonzalo, uh, marvelous, and Patrick in absentia. Thank you so much, just so moving and powerful. Um, so we now come to, um, and we're going to continue some of the themes that you just heard. Uh, we now come to our last major speaker of the conference. Um, somebody we're very honored to have with us, and that's Dr. Ahmad Samast. And we've been looking forward for a few years to finding a moment when we could bring Dr. Samast here to speak with us. 
Many of you will remember the heart-rending story of the evacuation of the students of the Afghanistan National Institute of Music from Kabul in 2021 and their eventual relocation to Lisbon, Portugal. It's a remarkable story of determination, humanity, and heroism. And the story starts almost 15 years ago with the establishment of the Institute uh, in 2010, and Dr. Samast will tell you about that shortly. So to introduce Dr. Samast, I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Anne Graham to the stage. In her years of leadership of Texans for the Arts, Anne was an essential partner to the League in the national efforts to secure pandemic relief and has been an amazing champion for individual creativity here in Texas. She also has a personal connection to orchestral music, and I know she's looking forward to sharing that with you. So please, to welcome Dr. Samast, please first welcome Anne Graham. Thank you so much. Thank you all, that was pretty hard. Um, performance to follow, but a really beautiful thing that's making me weep. Um, thank you, Simon. I'm really humbled to be asked to share brief remarks to introduce our plenary speaker and thank all of you for actively engaging with your orchestras across the country. Whether you represent executive leadership, board of directors, volunteers, musicians and artists, administrators, citizens at large, you are the very best spokespeople and advocates in importance of supporting the arts and music making across your states and to the country. I'd like to take advantage of being here in Texas and to just give a shout out to the TASO, Texas Association for Symphony Orchestras, which is our coalition. There's a good TASO representation here today. Um, just to thank all of you as, a, as an emblem of the, the important role that the volunteers play. Um, TASO represents over 40 organizations and, and orchestras across the state. An incredible uh, volunteer power. The Juanita Miller Concerto Competition raised over six million dollars last year for the arts and music and across the state and they're just a remarkable volunteer group and I know many of you have these groups as well and I applaud all of you for that. It is serendipitous that I'm here today first having crossed paths with the leagues in 1988, five years before even moving or knowing I was moving to Texas. On behalf of the New England Philharmonic, I was invited to Chicago to accept the ASCAP Award for New Music for a community-based orchestra, something that the New England Philharmonic has gone on to receive numerous times. The New England Philharmonic's Composer in Residence program call for scores, their young artist, conductor, and, and competition, um, their, and more, strive to ensure dynamic forward thinking and forward acting programming for classical music including strengthening cross-cultural ex um, expression. I was actually the co-director, executive director of the New England Philharmonic for 12 years in Cambridge. Played the cello in that and my husband played the clarinet. So orchestral music goes way back in our family and we're strong believers in it. From my 10 years at the helm of Texans for the Arts, I've seen example after example of the unique role of the arts in not just overcoming um, differences to fuel, but to fuel tolerance, but in cultivating compassion and understanding. Almost all of your states have statewide arts advocacy organizations, and if you aren't a member and aren't engaged with them, I really encourage you to do so. They work both at the state and the national level and are vital to our effective advocacy work. I witness the extraordinary power of music as a unifying force from finding common ground on complex policy issues in our own state capitals and to changing lives through community-based artistry. Programs like the Extraordinary Resilient Sounds Project we just heard and like the Afghan National Institute of Music of which we will hear shortly. And of the internationally recognized work of Austin Classical Guitar, whose work with incarcerated youth in the juvenile justice system shows us a safe and supportive way that students can make and be something special and build an identity to be proud of. Where other pursuits might fail, music can forge powerful connections that last a lifetime. Studying music can reveal a better path and link an individual to themselves and to their communities. 
as you finish these three days together and soon return to our daily life that can feel extremely fragmented and divisive, it's appropriate to be reminded of the potential of the arts as a unifying force by today's featured speaker, Dr. Ahmad Sarmast, the founder and director of the National Af Afghan National Institute of Music. The Afghan Afghanistan National Institute of Music was founded in 2010 as the first and only school of music in Afghanistan, where talented Afghani children, regardless of their gender, social circumstances, and ethnic background, could be trained in a co-educational environment in Afghan traditional and Western classical music. When the Taliban retook power in, 18, in August 2021, Dr. Sarmast worked with an international coalition to rescue the 273 members of the school and reestablish it in Braga, Portugal. The young musicians have ever since represented a beacon of hope, performing this past January at the opening ceremony of the UN Human Rights Council. And Dr. Sarmast has been recognized globally for his unwavering commitment to leveraging the power of music to advance social justice. It's an honor to welcome Dr. Sarmast to tell us more about how we can dream big about the way we use music for the good of all. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Sarmast. It's a great pleasure and honor to be standing here today in front of you to tell the story of the Afghanistan National Institute of Music, once considered to be the happiest place in Afghanistan, also known as a beacon of hope for the country. When we are speaking about the Afghanistan National Institute of Music, its establishment and then relocation and flee from Afghanistan is linked to one particular name or word, which is called Taliban. Back in 2020 and early 2021, there was a lot of speculation in the international media, in political cycles, in, uh, that the Taliban of 2021 are a better Taliban, a different Taliban than the Taliban of 1996. But for us, working in Afghanistan, witnessing the crime committed by the Taliban against the people of Afghanistan, it was clear that the Taliban are not changed Taliban will not be changed, and the Taliban are not capable of changing. That was clearly proved in the last almost three years since the return of the Taliban back to power. When the Taliban came, we expected that with the return of the Taliban, a new cultural genocide similarly to the cultural genocide committed by the Taliban during their first run will repeat in Afghanistan. We knew that the day of music is over. The women rights will be denied. The cultural rights and the musical rights of the Afghan people will be once again toppled by these forces. And today that I'm standing in front of you Taliban, similarly to 1996, denied all musical rights of the Afghan people. Rights to learn musical languages, rights to make music, being involved in music, rights to study musical languages, making music and also be involved. At the same time, in the same time, Afghan musicians have been denied rights to make a living through music education and to have on their access all platforms so they can share their artistic abilities, their arts with the wider community. In other words, today 
Afghanistan is a silent nation, entirely silent. The people of Afghanistan have been forced once again into silence by the Taliban. I wish it was just the only issue, music or mu and musical rights of the Afghan people. But today, Afghanistan has been turned into a prison for half of its population, the women of Afghanistan. Since their return, the Taliban in a systematic manner are involved in agenda apartheid in Afghanistan. Afghan women have been forced out of education. They denied education above the age of 10. They denied access to the labor market and employment. They are denied freedom of movement within the country or outside of the country. Most importantly, which is very tragic and shocking, that the women of Afghanistan cannot even enjoy the nature together with the rest of their families. They are allowed, sorry, they are prevented from going to the parks and public places for leisure with the rest of their community. To make it very clear today, Afghanistan is an open prison for its people in general, but for the women of Afghanistan entirely. In addition to everything else, the forced dress code has been imposed to the Afghan women. Women who moved a long way in the last 20 years before the return of the Taliban. Women who've been representing Afghanistan as diplomats worldwide. Women who acted as ministers, social figures, cultural figures. But today, once again, they're suffering for a systematic gender genocide by the Taliban. When I'm speaking about women represented everywhere, since its establishment, the Afghanistan National Institute of Music did everything and was committed, and one of the objectives of the school was to empowering girls of Afghanistan, to ensuring gender equality in Afghan society, to ensuring gender equality in arts and culture, but most precisely in music, to return the musical rights of the Afghan people. We managed even to establish the Old Women Orchestra of Afghanistan, which was widely acknowledged, recognized, and very popular outside Afghanistan. An orchestra that served as a symbol of women uh, emancipation in Afghanistan. But when the Taliban came back, the orchestra had to flee for their life. The return of the Taliban for Afghanistan, for musicians of Afghanistan, means the return of darkness to the country. A place once considered the happiest place in Afghanistan today is under the heel of the Taliban. The laughter, the happiness that exists in the school does not exist anymore. The Taliban took over the Afghanistan National Institute of Music like a, military, like a military objective. They took over the school in the first hours when they entered the Kabul, and since then, they have the school under their control. The property of the school has been confiscated. Its bank account has been confiscated. Musical instrument broken. And the school has been turned into a military barrack of one of the notorious terrorists of our time, Haqqani, the Haqqani network. The same Haqqani that is in the blacklist of the United Nations and still 10 million bounty ex uh, exist is were about. But today, this gentleman is freely traveling around the world while there's still there's a restriction on his movement. Afghanistan was very proud of its orchestras, of the women orchestra, Afghan youth orchestra, and the music school itself. And that's why the school was widely acknowledged with number of Marble, a number of paintings around the city of the school and the orchestra. The first hour of the return of the Taliban, they not only 
silence the school, they shut down the school, they make it inaccessible to the, to the students and to the faculty, but they began erasing from the history of arts, culture, and the history of music, the name of the Afghanistan Nationalist of Music by painting morals on the streets of Kabul. There's always, after a dark night, there's bright future. Back in August, when our life was at risk, when we did not know what's going to happen with the school, whether the kids would be allowed to dream once again and to chase their dreams, we began reaching out to the people of goodwill worldwide. We formed a coalition of philanthropists, music institutions, music advocacy group, politicians, lawyers, head of state, senators, to make sure that we rescue the students of the Afghanistan National Institute of Music. It's not because their music, they were in the full front of democratic changes in Afghanistan before the return of the Taliban. They were making a very tangible contribution not only to the revival of Afghan music, not only to the promotion of musical diversity in Afghanistan, not only to ensuring the musical rights of the Afghan people, but also towards establishing a just and civil society in Afghanistan. We were always in the hate list of the Taliban. They always wanted to silence that music school that became strong, influential, known nationally and internationally, and recognized and acknowledged. In 2014, they sent a bomber in one of our, of our performances. In 2015, 17, and 20, two other networks have been arrested who've been plotting against the school. In 2020, the school was top in the hit list of the Taliban. So in such a circumstances, we could know, when the Taliban reached out, knowing what's happened with us in the past, what's happened with the music, we could know relax and wait what the Taliban are going to do. So we began reaching to our friends outside Afghanistan to leave Afghanistan and to give an opportunity to our students once again. The government of Portugal was the first and the only country in the world that positively responded to our appeal to get the entire school community out of Afghanistan and to give us a group asylum. That was not the end of the story. It needs to be coordinated. We need to find the resources. We need to find friends who would be negotiating on our behalf with the Taliban to make sure that the students are able to leave Afghanistan. And once we leave, left Afghanistan also, it was very important to keep and to maintain the school together and to make sure that the kids are not forced into the labor market, but they have got another opportunity to go back to school, to pick up their instrument back, to get into education, and to continue what they've been doing for the last, since the enrollment in the Afghanistan National of Music. Learning music, playing music, and delivering smile and happiness to the Afghan people through music. Eventually, we arrived to Portugal. We had to fight for our integrity because we have been traveling with 73 minor students, minor musicians, not accompanied by their parents. The kids were forced to leave their families behind. We had only 286 places for our community to be included and to be received in Portugal. So, therefore, our top priority was students, teachers, and staff of the school, and we knew that eventually we would be able to reunite the kids with their families. And today that I'm standing here, I'm very pleased and very honored to announce that the government of Portugal agreed to receive 368 siblings and parents of the students. Once again, we are working very closely We are working very closely with the government of Qatar, who has got a very good relationship with the Taliban, a huge influence, so we can get the families 
also in a similar approach to Doha, and then we will be chartering an airplane to get them to free them back to, and to reunite them with their families. It's not just a normal reunification when we are talking about the families, but also it's ensuring freedom to another 368 people, the majority of women who are women and girls. So in this manner, we reunite them with their families, but also we ensure their freedom, and they will be able once again to dream and to chase their dreams. Since our departure, all our students are back enrolled in conservatory program. They continue their music education, and we established all ensemble and orchestras that was once a pride of Afghanistan. Today, the Afghan Youth Orchestra has been rebuilt, and is back in full force at the global stages. And since 2022, we played and toured to many countries in Europe, including playing a sold-out concert in Gulbenkian Center. We played a sold-out concert in Victoria Hall in Geneva. We played a sold-out concert in Teatro Rossini in Italy. Recently, we, have, we completed a four-city uh, tour of the United Kingdom, which had all its own dramas when we've been denied visa by the UK Homeland uh, Home Security offices, but eventually they changed, but we went there. Wherever we are going today, we're going with this one message. In the past, before the return of the Taliban, we've been traveling to the world to show how much changed in Afghanistan, how much Afghanistan progressed, how far Afghanistan moved since the, return, since the removal of the Taliban. So it was tour of celebrating the return of music to Afghanistan. It was celebrating freedom of the Afghan people. It was celebrating, it was tours on celebrating the achievement of Afghan women. But today, when we are traveling, of course we are not traveling with a pessimistic note. We are traveling today also around the world with a, with a strong voices, much taller than we've been in 2021, but with a few single messages of awareness, to raise awareness, but also to do advocacy for the restoration of the music rights, cultural rights, women rights in Afghanistan. And today, when I'm standing here in front of you, once again, I'm calling on you. I clearly and strongly believe that every musician is a diplomat. So let's make together sure that the Taliban who've been brought back to Afghanistan, who've been imposed on the Afghan people, they do not get a recognition. Let's put our voices together to make sure the music rights of the Afghan people are returned. That the children of Afghanistan, the youth of Afghanistan, without fear, are able to benefit from the power of music. To enjoy, to make sure that delivering a musical instrument to a child will make this child to smile and make them happy. So up until now, everything that we did, it was possible back in Afghanistan. During the evacuation, those tough days that we've been struggling for, us, for our surveillance, we did everything with the support of the people of goodwill. When I'm talking about the support of people of goodwill, it's important to acknowledge here, you all, you all. In those tough days, I never forget that when we reached out and my team was reaching out with musicians and music industry and music uh, advocacy group around the world, they also reached to Simon for help and assistance. I never forget the emails that I received back when I was struggling to get our community to safety, that emails that Heather Noonan connected us with people of influence in the United States who could help us to get to Afghanistan, who could help us to get to the Kabul airport. Thank you very much, the League of American Orchestra, not only having me today here for amplifying our voices, but also for being next year to us on those tough days. Today, the students of the Afghanistan National Institute of Music, its orchestras and ensembles, are serving as the symbol of hope resilience, and inspiration. We are not 
only safeguarding the Afghan music, but also we're sharing it with the world wide. Soon, we will be in the United States of America where the Afghan Youth Orchestra will be playing side by side by some member of the European Union Youth Orchestra at Kennedy Center and Carnegie Hall on the 7th and 8th of August. I hope if you will be around, please pop in and support us. Our support was, and our, our existence was possible by your support, and we hope that this will be continuing. Our sustainability and existence to save the voice, to, to save Afghan people, Afghan music, and to connect Afghan musicians with the rest of the world depends on your solidarity with our institution. Thank you very much for having me here, and thank you very much for making our students to dream and dream big once again. Thank you so much, Dr. Samas, for just an extraordinary, extraordinary story. And um, it's, it's hard to follow that. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just remarkable. I mean, we, it makes me reflect. I was sitting there thinking about the freedoms that we enjoy. We think about the work that we do in our schools, and we think about our, our children and the freedoms that they enjoy and, and how hard uh, that still is to fight for those freedoms in some places. So, it, it, I mean, it's, an, it's a story with an in, in, incredible outcome for, the, for these young, young women and young people of the school, but we also have to remember that not everywhere in the world still to this day uh, has those rights that we enjoy here in this country. So it makes me reflect as we come to the end of the, cons or the, end of the conference on very much on what, what, why music matters. And I'm thinking about uh, what we heard earlier from um, the wonderful new work from the Houston Symphony and the, the program, their program with, um, uh, with Patrick Lenz's work and I'm hearing about this and I'm, and I'm reflecting back to the very beginning of the conference. And I'm thinking about Gabriella Lina Frank and her words, which somehow um, after, after this afternoon session just kind of ring even more true. She, she spoke about um, this obligation to be the ancestors for the next generation. And I love that so much, that idea, because I think that what we do as orchestras is we, we tell the stories of who we are today. We have a power in music to, to tell the stories of our time that people will be talking about in the future. And you know, music and the orchestras, we talk a lot about our, our ability to be organizations that entertain people. We talk about how we uplift and inspire. But what is so incredibly important for us to um, remember is that we don't only tell stories which are uplifting, inspiring, but we tell stories about all of humanity. And that's what makes orchestras so rich. And uh, I, you know, I'm personally very proud for the for the work that's happening. And then this week we've heard, you know, we've had this big um, spotlight this week on composers, and those composers are helping the stories, helping tell the stories of their communities. However difficult, they're helping uh, helping telling the stories of the communities and of our communities, which will be. Um, there for our ancestors, uh, which will be there for our next generations to look back on. So, tremendous, tremendous uh, moving theme that has kind of played all through conference. Okay, so taking a deep breath, we'll come to the end of conference. Um, 
what what do, um, you know? I have this is, comes to my moment when I have to think about um, how to sum anything up, and I, it's always very difficult, and it's especially difficult after such a wonderful presentation as we've heard today. But look, here's what I want to say. I don't know about you, but I felt through this conference a great spirit of optimism. I really felt that, and you know, it's this field has been through some really tough years, um, but. There was somehow, you know, I always tell people, orchestras are resilient, orchestras are creative. Um, we come back after the most difficult times. We sit down, we think about what needs to happen. We go out and think about how we can be different and how we can come out and meet what's in front of us. And I, I have tremendous, tremendous optimism about that. Um, it, it is, um, it, it is ex it's the great, great strength of our field. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to have sort of felt that spirit so much in, in the corridors this week. The other thing I've, I've heard in the corridors this week was, you remember that on the very opening, I made the passing allusion to culture and the importance of organizational culture. I've heard a lot about that this week. I've heard a lot about that in sessions. I've heard about that in the corridors and in passing conversations. And as a sort of growing realization that, that this is um, something that is a, must be a major strategic imperative for our field, which is incredibly gratifying. But I've also had one other thought, and this morning, um, there was a, a really incredible presentation um, by Doug McLennan on artificial intelligence. And like, if you wanted to be truly scared, uh, you needed to be in that room this morning. Uh, because AI is accelerating at a, at a pace that um, we simply have no conception of. Um, the, the speed of change and the speed of change that is in front of us is almost beyond comprehension. It, it is going to change uh, almost every aspect of work and life and art as we know it. And I, I don't say that with any sense of hyperbole. Um, but one of the things that you can't get over is that essential sense of uh, the one thing that AI can't yet recreate is, as somebody said in this, this morning session, we are not mechanical, we're biological. Uh, human connectivity is in the end uh, the one thing that AI can never replicate. And that's what we feel here. And one of the things that gives me tremendous joy and optimism about um, our, 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 our field and our community is that when we come together, and we come together in conference like this, and we come together for these con conversations, uh, that human con con connectivity somehow creates magic. We have amazing conversations, and that is something that no machines can ever replicate. Human connectivity is at the heart of music. It's the stories we heard this morning, it's, and it's at the heart of what we all do, and it's, and it's why we show up here. So, um, really, that's it. And now we're thinking about, and we're thinking about next year. And the first thing I'm going to say to you is, um, we always, I think I said earlier in, in the conference, this conference is your conference. Uh, it's been tremendously uh, fantastic this week to have so many sessions which were proposed by you, proposed by our members, and have many speakers and many ideas which came forward um, from all of you. We'll do that again next year. Um, but we also really, really need your input. We want to hear from you what worked about conference, what didn't work about conference, what you'd like to do differently, um, and we will take that into consideration. So there will be a survey. You'll get that very soon, and please fill it out. It really matters. So as I mentioned, when we first uh, came here at the very beginning, this was um, the uh, League's very first conference uh, in Houston ever, and it's 79 years. I'm sorry, Houston, that you had to wait 79 years. And I think we can all agree that it was worth the wait, right? And, and I want to thank everybody who's contributed uh, to the conference this year from Houston. Of course, the Houston Symphony, our friends at ROCO who provided such a tremendous contribution, um, all the other ensembles that performed Mercury and all the other ensembles that performed this week. Uh, Houston is such a vibrant place, it's such a, it's such a vibrant musical community, and it's been absolutely wonderful to be here to show it, show it off. 
And next year, we have another first, because next year we're also going to a city for the first time in our history. So the league's 80th conference will be in Salt Lake City. Um, we will be there next June. Um, and if you've been to Salt Lake City, you'll know what I'm just about to tell you, which is that it is an absolutely beautiful city with the Wasatch Mountains behind it. A more spectacular city setting is, is hard to imagine. Um, it's a great outdoor city and there's tremendous things to add on there. But as we've been getting to know the, the city in preparation for the con conference, we've been bowled over uh, by its dynamism and contemporary spirit. It's a really uh, tremendously exciting place and the, op the, the options in front of us there for content are actually really, really exciting. So we're very, very excited to explore that over the next year and we're looking forward to working with uh, Utah Symphony and Utah Opera. And having them as a partner will be a great benefit. And this is an organization, by the way, that we have significant and important history with. Maurice Bravanel, the longtime music director of the Utah Symphony, was a national figure for arts advocacy. And he was the league's artistic advisor from 1985 until his passing in 1993. We're also very lucky to have our board member on the League of American Orchestras, Pat Richards, our former chair, who was chair of the League from 2014 to 2017, um, was also uh, a former chair of the Utah Symphony Opera and Board. So uh, we've got wonderful connections with Salt Lake City, a place with tremendous musical history, um, and it's a place you're going to enjoy visiting tremendously. And so. This is the moment when we pass the baton and we say thank you, John, and we invite um, uh, our very dear friend Steve Brosvik, who's the uh, president and CEO of the Utah Symphony, who, by the way, is also an alumni of the uh, League's um, Orchestra Management Fellowship Program. So Steve's a very much League family member. So please welcome Steve Brosvik. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, before I say anything else, I want to say thank you to Simon and everyone at the League for creating yet another convening that has been deeply moving, meaningful, and helpful to all of us. These convenings are so important to bring us together so that we can learn from each other, find out what everybody is doing. There's such great work happening all across the country. And then we can take that home and imbue that into the work that we're doing with new ideas, new creativity, new energy. Uh, to John Mangum and the entire staff board and volunteer group uh, at the Houston Symphony, thank you very much for creating very large shoes for us to fill. And Simon, you said something on Thursday night at the, the donor dinner that I thought was important and worth repeating. And, and that was the observation that this is a community. We serve our communities at home, but this is a community that we all draw upon. And we create connections when we're together. And today I learned one thing that maybe, after listening to all these realities, we go home and maybe our challenges, while very real, are maybe very small. So with that, we want to invite you and welcome you to Salt Lake City to convene again and keep learning. Uh, I arrived in Utah and very quickly understood that this was a community that was worth sharing. It was an arts community worth sharing, and it's an orchestra that's worth hearing. And it was long past time uh, to have everybody come and enjoy us, enjoy this community, and learn why such great work is happening. Um, Utah's an incredible place. We have five national parks. We have 46 state parks. Downtown is within 45 minutes of 11 ski resorts, many of which are open in the summer for hiking, mountain biking, etc. Um, but it's also an incredible arts community because when the pioneers came across the prairie in covered wagons, they also brought pianos and organs and musical instruments with them. And when Salt Lake City was founded, the first public building that was built and opened was the music hall. So arts are embedded deeply in the community and we're really looking forward to sharing that with you. Now, a couple of quick things, things to be prepared for, things to be aware of before you come. Um, first, we really hope you will come early and stay late because we think you will want to. Uh, the airport is six minutes from downtown. The light rail is $2.50 and it goes directly to the concert hall from the airport. 
Um, you want to remember to drink an incredible amount of water. Average humidity in the summer is about 5%. Drink water, avoid headaches. Um, you're also going to want to download the All Trails app for your phone and perhaps an altimeter app. Bring hiking or comfortable shoes with you because during the lunch breaks you may be tempted to literally walk to the mountain because you can. And maybe most importantly, for all of us, because we know how conference goes, bring your ID with you everywhere. You will need it to get into a restaurant or a bar, and they will check it at the door. Everyone gets carded, so bring it with you. <laughs> and maybe last but not least, you will be able to get extraordinary coffee and lots of post-conference evening alcohol with each other. Beverages are important to this group. It's where a lot of the great work and conversations happen is at the end of the day, and you will not be disappointed. So with that, I'm gonna leave the stage, turn it back over to Simon, and just welcome you to Salt Lake City next season. Have a great season. Connecting mountains with metropolis. Connecting day trips with nightlife. Connecting tradition with innovation. Connecting elevation with inspiration. And since 2002, connecting symphony with opera. Welcome to stunning Salt Lake City, home of Utah Symphony Utah Opera, and a place of limitless exploration in our mission to connect our community through great live music. Join us at the League of American Orchestras National Conference in June 2025 and discover the possibilities when we connect. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Okay, it's a wrap. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, big thanks to the league staff, to everybody at the Marriott, the wonderful Marriott team. We appreciate you very much. Uh, thank you to our uh, AV um, support and, and great AV team over there. Thank you very much. And all the other contractors who've helped us put the conference together. Um, most of all, thank you to all of you being here for showing up both physically and also showing up with your heart and soul. Let's go and celebrate the power of music for another year. Thank you so much. Conference 2024 is now closed. Thank you so much.